before I started my company, and you can start to age me now, but before I started my company, this is what happened with music. You had a film, a writer was asked to write music for that film, and that music became an intrinsic part of that film. That was what was known as writing for film. It was what the industry understood as synchronization. So you had the Rogers and Hammersteins and so on and so forth, and they wrote the music for that film. Towards the end of the 70s, the music was actually, somebody had a bright idea, and they started to take one track, which had been made for entertainment purposes, and decide to put it in the film. And they started to get new soundtracks, think 2001 Odyssey. And that was the first time that music that hadn't been written for film was being used from one place and being used in another place. Now, the advertising industry are magpies. They, what they do is they watch what's going on in the rest of the world, and they particularly watch what's going on in the film world. And so they, started taking, they went from doing something like this, where they took composers who wrote to picture, and they moved into something else. So uh, this is something that not many of you will be familiar with, but... Um, Smash, get smash. Shake out back and put the freshness back. Shake and back. So this was known as jingle writing. It worked. It actually worked. But it was the bottom end of the uh, advertising industry and the music industry. Nobody liked to admit that they actually did this, except people who, the rumour is, who wrote the, the Mars A Day Helps You Work, Rest and Play, he retired for the rest of his life on writing that jingle. Because that, what they used to do is they would repeat the commercials over and over again, and of course you got your uh, performance revenue from the broadcasters. So this was a very successful way for advertisers to tell you what the product was, put it to a, a mnemonic, with, a, with the lyric, with the music, suddenly you've got a nursery rhyme, which is the way all of us learn and understand and hear music. But there was a guy called John Hegarty, who is now Sir John Hegarty, at BBH, and people were playing a lot with how they use music. And the first time that somebody realised that something special could be done was when this commercial came out. absolute explosion. The record went to number one, which was really interesting because did anybody recognise the difference in that soundtrack? Because it was a sound alike. It wasn't Marvin Gaye. So what happened was Levi's got such a success that they went, there was a run of these. Everybody wanted to be on the Levi's commercial because the, the records were going to number one, or so they told us. When you actually do the, the looking back over the history, you'll actually find that it was probably less than half made it to the charts and a lot of them bombed. But they only ever spoke, fantastic PR, they only ever spoke about the records that, enabled, that they had enabled to, to be chart successes or re-enter the charts. Now what that did was it created a myth. It created a myth which was a very dangerous myth for the music industry because we were already starting to look. We changed our formats. We were looking to see how we could sell more music. And this seemed to be a lifeboat. And I know I had many conversations with many producers who said, yeah, put it on my commercial and we'll take it to number one. Actually, you should be paying us to put it on your commercial. It's a fantastic marketing uh, platform for you. These guys started a big problem. 
Certainly. Nine out of ten agree that lashes look remarkably long, day after day. New Lash Accelerator Mascara from Rimmel London. Get the London look. Okay. So they had this idea that they would find all these London bands and they'd put their music on the commercials and they were just churning them out one after the other. And we went from an average license fee of, say, 25,000 for the publishing, where these guys were saying, I'll give you 5,000 pounds for the world. And there were bands that would do it. So, and the reason they would do it was because they were being sold the myth about the Levi's. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't even, I've seen hundreds of these types of commercials. I can't even name the bands. And I don't think it helped them in their careers one little bit. Because there's some things that they should have been asking to do, which they didn't. So as an industry, we started to create a monster. We saw somebody that had money. We wanted some of that money. We, we could see that they gave us a massive platform, massive exposure to our music, and we wanted to be part of it. So we found ourselves in a situation today where we don't sell albums anymore. The downloads are declining. Streaming is increasing. As I said to somebody at Spotify the other week, I'm going to be 180 if I was an artist before I get money that's worth anything to me. Um, we, we give our playlists away for free. Now this was a big bone of contention for me because as publishers, what they wanted to do was they, wanted, they thought they'd found a way to stimulate music. So when advertising agencies came to them and said, can we have music for a commercial, they would start to stimulate their briefs. And they would give that away for free, which other music supervisors charged for. Now by giving it away for free, their thinking was if I get one, I've paid this guy's salary because I've made £25,000 and I've paid this guy's salary. If these are coming in regularly and if I give it away for free, it will increase, it, I'll increase the number of hits that I get in my sync licensing. And what that actually did is it meant it created people at the industry, in the advertising industry, who just brief out. And they asked for playlist after playlist after playlist. And I know that I can be, I can be asked to look at 750 tracks before we get down to the one I'll know it when I hear it. And don't ask me how they know that they will know it when they hear it, because often it's decided on time and money and clearance periods. So these playlists for free was something that the publishers did, in all good intentions as a marketing exercise on behalf of their writers. But what it did in the minds of the advertising industry is it meant there was more music available for free and people were prepared to give their ideas away for free. And that had an impact on production. So now, I know writers that are being asked to write and produce. Can you do me a demo? Can you produce me a master? Can I have this for the world for six, seven thousand? We've only got this in our budget. We haven't got any money. Why should anybody work for nothing? The commercial doesn't. The, the agency don't work for money, for nothing. Nobody else in the system works for nothing. At least pay the demo fee. And now, People are asking if you can share your publishing with them. The brands are saying, can we co-publish with you? For me, and it, it may be I'm not seeing something that everybody else is seeing, but this is the thin end of the wedge. The publishing is your IP. This belongs to you. These guys aren't publishers, they're brands. They sell Heinz baked beans and bleach. So where do we go from here? Do we give away our sync licenses for free? Just give them for a steal. So what's the story today? This, is, this was done by Millward Brown. Millward Brown are the research company for the advertising and, and branding industry. This is the, what they found was the, the relative importance of sight and sound in a commercial. So you can see 58% for sight and 41% for sound, which means visually we're taking in more information than we're actually listening to. Anybody got any idea what the, the relativity is in terms of money for production, visual production versus um, sound production? Anybody got any idea what the percentage would be? Okay. That's what they allow for the visuals out their budget, and that's what they allow for sound. Now, for me, this looks incredibly disproportionate uh, considering sound is actually 50, nearly 50 percent of the experience so what's going on and it's very easy to understand what's going on you when you work with when you go into an advertising industry you'll find that most of the people there are visual 
they're artists, they're photographers, they're designers, they're typographers. They're using their eyes all the time. So for them, once the budget starts rolling, you can understand how they get caught up in the whole visual creative process. And the sound, because it comes at the end, is something which is what's left in the budget. But there is good news, it is changing. These are the reasons why people want to use music. I'm sure you know them. Um, it, is, it, excuse me, it has the evocative and expressive powers to communicate at a very deep level and visceral level. It grabs you. I don't know about you, but I can hear something. I'd be driving along in the car, not even listening, trying to negotiate North London traffic to get into, into town, and suddenly the tears are running down my face. And I realize I'm listening to a track and somebody's got me really got me and it happened last week on Chris Evans when a girl called Christina Ellis I think her name is and she sang Roy Orbison's Crying and she sang it with such tenderness that I thought that is what music is all about that very moment when she connected with me before I had the chance to to cognitively understand what was going on she uh, she just got straight into my heart and she grabbed it it's a universal language any country needs no explanation or translation. We understand. We understand major and minor chords. We understand if we've never heard the music before, we understand it. There's a wonderful piece of research by a guy called Tom Fitch, who I can give you the name of, did a piece of research in a, an a African tribe way back in the jungle, never heard any music before, and he did a test where he tested whether or not they could tell the difference between Western music, which they've never been exposed to, and they got it like that. They understood sad, angry, happy music. And it's, and it's just universal. So you are creating something magical. I hope your, your heads are getting bigger, because this is really important. It has an effect of us, on a, and it stirs up personal associations. People talk about the soundtrack of your life. They talk about the music that resonated with you when you're 17. It's a truth. It is a truth that the music that we related to, first girlfriend, first boyfriend, got stood up, first dance, whatever it, it means, a birthday party. I've done some uh, workshops when I've asked people to take them back. And you get men in their 60s and 70s crying about a piece of music they used to listen to with their dads. So we can't control it, we don't, we lock it away, but it's there, it's logged. It's the last thing, that musical association is the last thing that even an Alzheimer's patient has. It, it connects at that level. Alzheimer's patients can't remember whether or not they put sugar in their tea or whether they even got a cup of tea in front of them. But they'll sing for you songs that they had when they were 17, like that. Wonderful footage. Look on the Nordoff Robin site, you'll see some of that. Um, it acts on our physiology. We get our hairs on the back of our neck stand on end. We tap our feet. We jig around. We can't help it. It, it evokes things in our subconscious that are beyond our control. And in a moment, this is the part. In a moment, the music, because brands now sell emotion. They don't sell functional qualities. They don't tell you how good it is. They tell you how you're going to feel about yourself. That's the big shift that's gone on in advertising. And in a moment, the beat of the music literally connects with the heartbeat of the consumer. And if they can find that piece of music that will connect with the heartbeat of their consumer, they're on a winner. And that's what the brands are trying to harness. That's what they're trying to understand at the moment. And they are thinking much more deeply than the advertising industries who think on a campaign by campaign basis. They're now thinking about their brands, which they always have done, as a, a personality that's got values and principles, and the music now needs to match that.